Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French. Forward by James H. Hyslop, LLD, Secretary of the Society for Psychical Research. Ghost stories lend themselves well to fiction. They leave the imagination entirely free. In ordinary fiction, especially of the realistic type, we expect some concessions to be made to facts, but when it comes to ghost story, we assign no limits to the imagination. This is because the supernatural world offers us no standards for curbing our fancy. Icarus is given impunity in that atmosphere, and there is no sun to melt his wings. Whatever our wishes, we do not expect ghosts to be real, and we are fancy-free to invent or distort as we may. But in the twilight of human knowledge it was not thus. The boundaries of the real and the unreal were undefined, and the belief in the supernatural, while it allowed the imagination free reigns, revealed little difference between its creations and the ideas men held of the actual world. In this overlapping of the real and the imaginary, the ghost story arose and has never lost its interest for men, though the cold judgment of science deprived the real thing of its terrors. As knowledge increased and extended its domain, ghosts were reduced to hallucinations, much to the disappointment of lovers of the marvelous, and cultivated minds could only toy with them as objects either of literary fancy or of amusement against their less fortunate neighbors who desired to believe in them. Intellectuals who came into contact with stories like those in the phantasms of the living indulgently spoke of them with a mixture of humor and tolerance, which prevented them from either believing or denying them. But writers of fiction had no responsibilities and were not judged by the standards of either belief or unbelief while the general public followed its tastes and imagination, chafed under the restraints of skepticism, and chose the easy road to satisfaction. In the present age, which is saturated with psychic research, whatever the motive or outcome of that movement, ghost stories have been revived partly because you can invoke interest under the cloak of science and partly because of an interest in the unknown and the desire to please our fancies, and fiction, which is art and not science, can escape the duty of preaching. The psychologist, however, may detect a concealed realism in the most audacious feats of the imagination, or an interest in the supernatural when the mind struggles to conceal or to ridicule it. Hence a collection of ghost stories, whatever their nature, may have their value for every class of readers. Some will want to invoke age and general human interest in behalf of certain prejudices, and others will want to quote them as illustrations of superstition. But all will like a good story well told and appealing to the imagination, which always affords mankind more satisfaction than facts. Besides, a collection of them may reveal disguises which science may uncover, however deeply concealed, by the respectability that will not offend science, or by the ignorance which suspects that there is more in them than is dreamt of in our philosophy. At any rate, we may read them without demanding that they shall conform to our sense of reality, and without expecting science to restrain the imagination. In other words, literature and its artistic interests will excuse us 
for an interest in them, while science will not hold us accountable for any indulgence of that interest. If the knowing can penetrate the veil and discover any truth in them, far beyond the ken of ordinary mortals, all others may complacently enjoy the illusion that they are superior to both science and superstition. With Macaulay, literature was more than the consolations of philosophy. This was because philosophy has only to be true, while literature has only to please. Or is it because literature is nearer the truth and can please at the same time? Perhaps in this age, when we are beginning to break down the barriers which science has set to the imagination, and this by an expansion of science itself, which is the nemesis of its own prejudices and arbitrarily imposed limits, we may find the salvation of both the intellect and the will. However this may be, with apparitions as a proved fact, and on the theory not due to chance in all instances, the fancies of the past may prove to have been founded in fact however dressed to suit the purposes of literary art. James H. Hyslop, New York, September 15th, 1917. End of Forward Section 1 of Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French Section 1 The House and the Brain, Part 1 By Lord Edward Bulwer Lytton. A friend of mine, who was a man of letters and a philosopher, said to me one day, as if between jest and earnest, Fancy, since we last met, I have discovered a haunted house in the midst of London. Really? Haunted? And by what? Ghosts? Well, I can't answer that question. All I know is this. Six weeks ago, my wife and I were in search of a furnished apartment. Passing a quiet street, we saw on the window of one of the houses a bill, Apartments Furnished. The situation suited us. We entered the house, liked the rooms, engaged them by the week, and left them the third day. No power on earth could have reconciled my wife to stay longer, and I don't wonder at it. What did you see? It was not so much what we saw or heard that drove us away. It was an undefinable terror which seized both of us whenever we passed by the door of a certain unfurnished room, in which we neither saw nor heard anything. Accordingly, on the fourth morning I summoned the woman who kept the house and attended on us, and told her that the rooms did not quite suit us and we would not stay out our week. She said dryly, I know why. You have stayed longer than any other lodger. Few ever stayed a second night, none before you a third. But I take it they have been very kind to you. They, who, I asked, affecting to smile. Why, they who haunt the house, whoever they are. I don't mind them. I remember them many years ago when I lived in this house, not as a servant. But I know they will be the death of me some day. I don't care, I'm old, and must die soon anyhow. And then I shall be with them and in, in this house still." The woman spoke with so dreary a calmness that, really, it was a sort of awe that prevented my conversing with her further. I paid for my week, and too happy were my wife and I to get off so cheaply. 
"'You excite my curiosity,' said I. "'Nothing I should like better than to sleep in a haunted house. "'Pray, give me the address of the one which you left so ignominiously.' "'My friend gave me the address, and when we parted, "'I walked straight toward the house thus indicated. "'It is situated on the north side of Oxford Street.' in a dull but respectable thoroughfare. I found the house shut up, no bill at the window, and no response to my knock. As I was turning away, a beer boy, collecting pewter pots at the neighboring areas, said to me, "'Do you want anyone at that house, sir?' "'Yes. I heard it was to be let.' "'Let?' Mr. J. offered Mother, who chars for him, a pound a week, just to open and shut the windows, and she would not. Would not? And why? The house is haunted, and the old woman who kept it was found dead in her bed with her eyes wide open. They say the devil strangled her. Pooh! "'You speak of Mr. J. Is he the owner of the house?' "'Yes.' "'Where does he live?' "'In G Street, number blank.' "'I gave the pot-boy the gratuity earned by his liberal information, "'and I was lucky enough to find Mr. J. at home, "'an elderly man with intelligent countenance and prepossessing manners.' I communicated my name and my business frankly. I said I heard the house was considered to be haunted, that I had a strong desire to examine a house with so equivocal a reputation, that I should be greatly obliged if he would allow me to hire it, though only for a night. I was willing to pay for that privilege, whatever he might be inclined to ask. "'Sir,' said Mr. J., with great courtesy, "'the house is at your service for as short or as long a time as you please. "'Rent is out of the question. "'The poor old woman who died in it three weeks ago was a pauper whom I took out of a workhouse, "'for in her childhood she had been known to some of my family.' and had once been in such good circumstances that she had rented that house of my uncle. She was a woman of superior education and strong mind, and was the only person I could ever induce to remain in the house. Indeed, since her death, which was sudden, and the coroner's inquest, which gave it a notoriety in the neighborhood, I have so despaired of finding any person to take charge of the house, much more a tenant, that I would willingly let it rent free for a year to anyone who would pay its rates and taxes. How long is it since the house acquired this sinister character? That I can scarcely tell you, but very many years since— the old woman I spoke of said it was haunted when she rented it between thirty and forty years ago. I never had one lodger who stayed more than three days. I do not tell you their stories. To no two lodgers have there been exactly the same phenomena repeated. It is better that you should judge for yourself then enter the house with an imagination influenced by previous narratives. Only be prepared to see and to hear something or other, and take whatever precautions you yourself please. Have you never had a curiosity yourself to pass a night in that house? Yes, I passed not a night— but three hours in broad daylight alone in that house. My curiosity is not satisfied, but it is quenched. 
I have no desire to renew the experiment. You cannot complain, you see, sir, that I am not sufficiently candid. And unless your interest be exceedingly eager, and your nerves unusually strong, I honestly add that I advise you not to pass a night in that house. My interest is exceedingly keen, said I and though only a coward will boast of his nerves in situations wholly unfamiliar to him, yet my nerves have been seasoned in such variety of danger that I have the right to rely on them, even in a haunted house. Mr. J. said very little more. He took the keys of his house out of his bureau, gave them to me, and thanking him cordially for his frankness and his urbane concession to my wish, I carried off my prize. Impatient for the experiment, as soon as I reached home, I summoned my confidential servant, a young man of gay spirits, fearless temper, and as free from superstitious prejudice as any one I could think of. F, said I, you remember in Germany how disappointed we were at not finding a ghost in that old castle, which was said to be haunted by a headless apparition? Well, I have heard of a house in London, which, I have reason to hope, is decidedly haunted. I mean to sleep there to-night. From what I hear, there is no doubt that something will allow itself to be seen or to be heard, something perhaps excessively horrible. Do you think, if I take you with me, I may rely on your presence of mind, whatever may happen? Oh, sir, pray trust me, answered F, grinning with delight. Very well. Then here are the keys of the house. This is the address. Go now, select for me any bedroom you please, and since the house has not been inhabited for weeks, make up a good fire, air the bed well, see, of course, that there are candles as well as fuel. Take with you my revolver and my dagger, so much for my weapons, Arm yourself equally well. And if we are not a match for a dozen ghosts, we shall be but a sorry couple of Englishmen. I was engaged for the rest of the day on business so urgent that I had not leisure to think much on the nocturnal adventure to which I had plighted my honor. I dined alone and very late, and while dining read as is my habit. I selected one of the volumes of Macaulay's essays. I thought to myself that I would take the book with me. There was so much of healthfulness in the style and practical life in the subjects that it would serve as an antidote against the influence of superstitious fancy. Accordingly, about half-past nine, I put the book into my pocket and strolled leisurely toward the haunted house. I took with me a favorite dog, an exceedingly sharp, bold, and vigilant bull terrier, a dog fond of prowling about strange ghostly corners and passages at night in search of rats, a dog of dogs for a ghost. It was a summer night, but chilly, the sky somewhat gloomy and overcast. Still there was a moon, faint and sickly, but still a moon. And if the clouds permitted after midnight, it would be brighter. I reached the house, knocked, and my servant opened the door with a cheerful smile. All right, sir, and very comfortable. Oh! said I, rather disappointed. 
Have you not seen or heard anything remarkable? Well, sir, I must own I have heard something queer. What? What? The sound of feet pattering behind me, and once or twice small noises like whispers close at my ear, nothing more. You are not at all frightened? I, not a bit of it, sir. And the man's bold look reassured me on one point, viz. that, happen what might, he would not desert me. We were in the hall, the street door closed, and my attention was now drawn to my dog. He had at first run in eagerly enough, but had sneaked back to the door, and was scratching and whining to get out. After patting him on the head and encouraging him gently, the dog seemed to reconcile himself to the situation and followed me and F. through the house, but keeping close at my heels, instead of hurrying inquisitively in advance, which was his usual and normal habit in all strange places. We first visited the subterranean apartments, the kitchen, and other offices, and especially the cellars in which there were two or three bottles of wine still left in a bin, covered with cobwebs, and evidently, by their appearance, undisturbed for many years. It was clear that the ghosts were not wine-bibbers. For the rest, we discovered nothing of interest. There was a gloomy little back yard with very high walls. The stones of this yard were very damp. And what with the damp, and what with the dust and smoke-grime on the pavement, our feet left a slight impression where we passed. And now appeared the first strange phenomenon witnessed by myself in this strange abode. I saw, just before me, the print of a foot suddenly form itself, as it were. I stopped, caught hold of my servant, and pointed to it. In advance of that footprint, as suddenly, dropped another. We both saw it. I advanced quickly to the place. The footprint kept advancing before me, a small footprint, the foot of a child. The impression was too faint thoroughly to distinguish the shape, but it seemed to us both that it was the print of a naked foot. This phenomenon ceased when we arrived at the opposite wall, nor did it repeat itself on returning. We remounted the stairs, and entered the rooms on the ground floor, a dining parlor, a small back parlor, and a still smaller third room that had been probably appropriated to a footman, all still as death. We then visited the drawing rooms, which seemed fresh and new. In the front room I seated myself in an armchair, F placed on the table the candlestick with which he had lighted us. I told him to shut the door. As he turned to do so, a chair opposite to me moved from the wall quickly and noiselessly, and dropped itself about a yard from my own, immediately fronting it. Why, this is better than the turning table, said I with a half laugh. And as I laughed, my dog put back his head and howled. F, coming back, had not observed the movement of the chair. He employed himself now in stilling the dog. I continued to gaze on the chair and fancied I saw on it a pale blue, misty outline of a human figure but an outline so indistinct that I could only distrust my own vision. The dog was now quiet. 
"'Put back that chair opposite to me,' said I to F. "'Put it back to the wall.' F obeyed. "'Was that you, sir?' said he, turning abruptly. "'I? What? "'Why, something struck me. "'I felt it sharply on the shoulder, just here.' "'No,' said I. "'But we have jugglers present, "'and though we may not discover their tricks, "'we shall catch them before they frighten us.' "'We did not stay long in the drawing-rooms. "'In fact, they felt so damp and so chilly "'that I was glad to get to the fire upstairs. "'We locked the doors of the drawing-rooms, a precaution which, I should observe, we had taken with all the rooms we had searched below. The bedroom my servant had selected for me was the best on the floor, a large one with two windows fronting the street. The four-posted bed, which took up no inconsiderable space, was opposite to the fire, which burnt clear and bright. A door in the wall to the left, between the bed and the window, communicated with the room which my servant appropriated to himself. This last was a small room with a sofa bed, and had no communication with the landing place, no other door but that which conducted to the bedroom I was to occupy. On either side of my fireplace was a cupboard, without locks, flush with the wall, and covered with the same dull brown paper. We examine these cupboards, only hooks to suspend female dresses, nothing else. We sounded the walls, evidently solid, the outer walls of the building. Having finished the survey of these apartments, warmed myself a few moments, and lighted my cigar, I then, still accompanied by F., went forth to complete my reconnoitre. In the landing place there was another door. It was closed firmly. Sir, said my servant in surprise, I unlocked this door with all the others when I first came. I cannot have got locked from the inside, for— Before he had finished his sentence, the door, which neither of us was then touching, opened quietly of itself. We looked at each other a single instant. The same thought seized both. Some human agency might be detected here. I rushed in first— my servant followed. A small, blank, dreary room without furniture. A few empty boxes and hampers in a corner. The small window. The shutters closed. Not even a fireplace. No other door but that by which we had entered. No carpet on the floor. And the floor seemed very old, uneven worm-eaten, mended here and there, as was shown by the whiter patches on the wood, but no living being and no visible place in which a living being could have hidden. As we stood gazing around, the door by which we had entered closed as quietly as it had before opened. We were imprisoned. For the first time I felt a creep of undefinable horror. Not so, my servant. Why, they don't think to trap us, sir. I could break that trumpery door with a kick of my foot. Try first, if it will open to your hand, said I, shaking off the vague apprehension that had seized me while I unclose the shutters and see what is without. I unbarred the shutters. The window looked 
on the little back yard I have before described, there was no ledge without, nothing to break the sheer descent of the wall. No man getting out of that window would have found any footing till he had fallen on the stones below. F, meanwhile, was vainly attempting to open the door. He now turned round to me and asked my permission to use force. And I should state here, in justice to the servant, that far from evincing any superstitious terrors, his nerve, composure, and even gaiety amid circumstances so extraordinary compelled my admiration and made me congratulate myself on having secured a companion in every way fitted to the occasion. I willingly gave him the permission he required. But though he was a remarkably strong man, his force was as idle as his milder efforts. The door did not even shake to his stoutest kick. Breathless and panting, he desisted. I then tried the door myself, equally in vain. As I ceased from the effort, again that creep of horror came over me, but this time it was more cold and stubborn. I felt as if some strange and ghastly exhalation were rising up from the chinks of that rugged floor and filling the atmosphere with a venomous influence hostile to human life. The door now very slowly and quietly opened, as of its own accord. We precipitated ourselves into the landing-place, we both saw a large, pale light, as large as the human figure, but shapeless and unsubstantial, move before us and ascend the stairs that led from the landing into the attic. I followed the light, and my servant followed me. It entered to the right of the landing, a small garret, of which the door stood open. I entered in the same instant. The light then collapsed into a small globule, exceedingly brilliant and vivid, rested a moment on a bed in the corner, quivered, and vanished. We approached the bed and examined it. A half-tester, such as is commonly found in attics devoted to servants. On the drawers that stood near it we perceived an old faded silk handkerchief, with the needle still left in a rent half-repaired. The kerchief was covered with dust. Probably it had belonged to the old woman who had last died in that house, and this might have been her sleeping-room. I had sufficient curiosity to open the drawers. There were a few odds and ends of female dress, and two letters tied round with a narrow ribbon of faded yellow. I took the liberty to possess myself of the letters. We found nothing else in the room worth noticing, nor did the light reappear. But we distinctly heard, as we turned to go, a pattering footfall on the floor just before us. We went through the other attics, in all four, the footfall still preceding us, nothing to be seen, nothing but the footfall heard. I had the letters in my hand, just as I was descending the stairs, I distinctly felt my wrist seized, and a faint soft effort made to draw the letters from my clasp. I only held them the more tightly, and the effort ceased. We regained the bedchamber appropriated to myself, and I then remarked that my dog had not followed us when we had left it. 
He was thrusting himself close to the fire and trembling. I was impatient to examine the letters, and while I read them, my servant opened a little box in which he had deposited the weapons I had ordered him to bring, took them out, placed them on a table close at my bedhead, and he occupied himself in soothing the dog, who, however, seemed to heed him very little. The letters were short. They were dated, the dates, exactly thirty-five years ago. They were evidently from a lover to his mistress or a husband to some young wife. Not only the terms of expression, but a distinct reference to a former voyage indicated the writer to have been a seafarer. The spelling and handwriting were those of a man imperfectly educated, but still the language itself was forcible. In the expressions of endearment there was a kind of rough wild love, but here and there were dark unintelligible hints at some secret knot of love, some secret that seemed of crime. We ought to love each other, was one of the sentences I remember. For how everyone else would execrate us if all was known. Again, don't let anyone be in the same room with you at night. You talk in your sleep. And again, what's done can't be undone. And I tell you there's nothing against us unless the dead could come to life. Here there was underlined in a better handwriting, a female's, They do! At the end of the letter, latest in date, the same female hand had written these words. Lost at sea the 4th of June, the same day as... I put down the letters and began to muse over their contents. Fearing, however, that the train of thought into which I fell might unsteady my nerves, I fully determined to keep my mind in a fit state to cope with whatever of marvelous the advancing night might bring forth. I roused myself laid the letters on the table, stirred up the fire, which was still bright and cheering, and opened my volume of Macaulay. I read quietly enough till about half-past eleven. I then threw myself dressed upon the bed, and told my servant he might retire to his own room, but must keep himself awake. I bade him leave open the door between the two rooms. Thus alone, I kept two candles burning on the table by my bedhead. I placed my watch beside the weapons and calmly resumed my Macaulay. Opposite to me the fire burned clear, and on the hearth rug seemingly asleep lay the dog. In about twenty minutes I felt an exceedingly cold air pass by my cheek like a sudden draught. I fancied the door to my right, communicating with the landing place, must have got open, but no, it was closed. I then turned my glance to my left and saw the flame of the candles violently swayed as by a wind. At the same moment, the watch beside the revolver softly slid from the table. Softly, softly. No visible hand. It was gone. I sprang up, seizing the revolver with one hand, the dagger with the other. I was not willing that my weapons should share the fate of the watch. Thus armed, I looked round the floor. No sign of the watch. Three slow, loud, distinct knocks 
were now heard at the bedhead. My servant called out, Is that you, sir? No, be on your guard. The dog now roused himself and sat on his haunches, his ears moving quickly backward and forward. He kept his eyes fixed on me with a look so strange that he concentrated all my attention on himself. Slowly he rose up, all his hair bristling, and stood perfectly rigid and with the same wild stare. I had not time, however, to examine the dog. Presently my servant emerged from his room, and if ever I saw horror in the human face, it was then. I should not have recognized him had we met in the street, so altered was his every lineament. He passed me by quickly, saying in a whisper that seemed scarcely to come from his lips, Run, run, it is after me. He gained the door to the landing, pulled it open, and rushed forth. I followed him into the landing involuntarily, calling him to stop. But without heeding me, he bounded down the stairs, clinging to the balusters, and taking several steps at a time. I heard, where I stood, the street door open, heard it again clap to. I was left alone in the haunted house. End of Section 1 The House and the Brain, Part 1 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.